You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. We're almost there. Episode 99 of the Straight to Video Podcast. One show away from 100 episodes. For me, that is huge. So thank you so much for continuing to listen. Before we head into triple figures for the podcast, I've got a wonderful chat on today's show with someone from one of the coolest bands of the last 40 years. It was an absolute pleasure for many reasons which I'll get into for me to chat with Stephen McDonald, who is the bass player for LA band Red Cross, along with also being a member of the band Off and the Melvins. Starting Red Cross with his brother Jeff when Stephen was, get this, 11 years old, the band would make their way through the LA punk and hardcore scenes of the early to mid 80s before focusing their songwriting on creating some of the most infectious power pop tunes ever put to tape. I've had the chance to see Red Cross live a few times over the years and got their albums, but diving into this chat and putting some of their history together, I realised I didn't know shit about this band. My knowledge was just the tiniest dent on what they've seen, done and achieved over their amazing career. What was cool for me though, being a fan of the LA pop metal scene of the late 80s, was to hear Steven's path through that same city, but how Red Cross interacted and became part of a totally different group of bands such as Black Flag and that whole LA hardcore scene. Knowing how young the two McDonald brothers were at this time makes the story even more surreal. Stephen mentions that he's been putting together some memories which I truly hope he can make into a book at some point because as you'll hear in our chat he is a great storyteller and it's a journey full of amazing experiences that deserves to be told and heard. Before we get into this great talk I want to thank my friends Dead Skull Coffee for continuing to support this show and offering you the listener 15% off any order placed at deadskullcoffee.co.uk of their rock and roll style ground or full bean coffee. Dead Skull Coffee are a true independent business with a great rock and roll attitude and work ethic so i'm proud to have them to be a continued part of this show so that's deadschoolcoffee.co.uk and add the promo code stv on checkout for that great discount Right, I'm excited for you to hear this chat with Stephen McDonald of Red Cross. If you're not familiar with the band, I hope it sparks your interest and gets you to check out some of their music and amazing history. Everything you need to know, including their UK and European tour dates for early next year, can be found at redcross.com. That's red spelled R-E-D-D and cross K-R-O-S-S, redcross.com. So here we go with episode 99 of the Straight to Video podcast, and it's a good one, as I speak to Stephen McDonald of Red Cross. Morning got away from me. I apologize. No problem, man. No problem. <laughs> Are you all good and comfortable? Yeah, I've had my coffee. You're going to have to keep me focused because I can go down rabbit hole. <laughs> That's fine. I like it where things just go left field. That's fine. I'll throw things right back to the beginning. You and your brother Jeff grew up in Hawthorne, California. A lot of us listening will be here in the UK. So could you maybe give us a bit of a rundown of where that is in kind of relation to, say, Hollywood and what it was like? Because I believe the Beach Boys are all originally from there, right? That's true. Um, Yeah, most notably home to the Wilson Brothers of the Beach Boys. Hawthorne is an L.A. and Los Angeles suburb. It's near the airport. I suppose for Londoners, it might be like sort of like living near Heathrow. Gotcha. Except for Heathrow still has the tube line. So less connected than than that. Right. Yeah, it's it's about 15 miles from Hollywood, but there's really no good direct bus line, uh, especially in the 70s when I was growing up. Our rapid transit system was pretty horrible. The western edge of it is about four miles inland from the beach. So it's funny that the Beach Boys were from Hawthorne because the truth of the matter was Dennis was the only person in the band that actually 
was a surfer. The rest of them were um, pasty tourists like the rest of us. But, you know, the Beach Boys were living there growing up in the 50s and the 60s. And Jeff and I were growing up in the 70s and the 80s. So we, we missed their era by a good two decades. I think in the 50s, it was one of these areas that had kind of sprung up after the Second War, after the Second World War. And it was uh, it was this big, it was one of the early suburban sprawl areas of L.A. And it was all these sort of like little tracked houses, I guess that's sort of like Milton Keynes or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, just like all these houses that all look exactly the same and, you know, but with a backyard and a front yard and, you know, and it was really kind of idyllic, I think, in the 50s and the 60s for the Beach Boys. By the time Jeff and I were coming of age, it was a bit um, grittier. And uh, yeah, there was a freeway moving in. I mean, freeway, you know, we've got these big uh, motorways. They call them freeways. <laughs> L.A. has a bunch of them slashing through the neighborhoods. And they were building a new one when I was growing up. They were building a new one that was going to come. There was only one access highway for the airport. And in Los Angeles, we need at least two. And we just happened to live along the planned route. So my whole childhood, we lived in um, with this knowledge that our house would eventually be taken away by the... Uh, pending freeway and the city kept replanning their route so they would buy a tract of houses and vacate them and then they would change their plan and then they would buy another tract of houses and vacate them so slowly my little idyllic neighborhood was slowly being eaten by a freeway project so it was interesting and then also we lived right behind one of the main sort of thoroughfares that goes east to west in the LA area it goes like 50 miles outside to like the desert a road called Imperial Highway and Randy Newman also immortalized it in his famous I love LA song it's one of the it's one of the streets but Imperial Highway was since once again right near LAX we had all this sort of uh, gritty sex working traffic on that street as well okay there were some strip clubs it was this weird transitional period because it was like you know a nice sort of idyllic suburban neighborhood that was slowly being eaten away by a pending freeway project and then it had the sort of gritty 70s a few strip clubs kind of soprano style west coast soprano stuff and then street prostitution so i'd be doing my paper routes in my little neighborhood. And then sometimes you'd have to like ride your bike all the way down one block that was otherwise all vacant houses for that one house that still existed. And of course they took the paper. So you'd have to ride your bike all the way down to that one house. And along the way, you might see, you know, a lady or two in a gentleman's car, you know, doing, just doing their business. <laughs> Wow. And all the girls were, and they were always really nice to me too. They'd always make sure they would acknowledge my existence. I mean, they were never like inappropriate. Um, they just like, hi, honey. Yeah. <laughs> Super. <laughs> so I was like, oh wow. So yeah, I mean, those are like some of my most vivid memories. When was the last time you went to that kind of area? What's it like now? Well, I still go there now. It's all different. Now it's all gentrified. That freeway has since been built. And that area, the neighborhood has either been repopulated with houses or there's a lot of industry around there now, like tech industry. Because also the industry around that whole area when I was growing up was the aerospace industry. They're either engineering, you know, rockets or they were engineering like uh, large commercial airlines and stuff. The kids in my neighborhood, the kids that live in the more affluent neighborhoods, their parents were all engineers. They're like white collar. And then I came from the more working class side and the kids were most of those kids' parents like worked in the factories. My dad is a welder. And so he kind of elevated himself by starting his own little welding company eventually. So he still has his own business. He still lives in that town. My dad's in his early 80s. He still works. Amazing. In fact, during all of COVID, he was able to work. He continued. He never had to stop working because he has a lot of government military contracts. He's always welding parts for some piece of something that goes on some kind of thing. Yeah. That's amazing. He's still working. That's nuts. It's just in his DNA. Yeah. I feel very fortunate that way in many ways. Yeah. Excellent. Was music always the thing you were into with having Jeff as your slightly older brother? Was you automatically into the things he was into? Yeah. I mean, Jeff is almost four years older than me. So, and he's, you know, had a huge personality. And like I said, we grew up in a small house, so we shared a bedroom. Like I was never 
without his um, influence in one way or another. And then he had kind of been influenced by, my dad is the oldest of, I think maybe eight siblings. So his youngest siblings, some of them were like 20 years younger. They were almost like much older brothers and sisters to us. They were still cool. (laughs) Yeah, they were into like rock and roll. And like my dad was never, my dad had, he had a little bit of a music collection when we were growing up. You know, like he had like a Waylon Jennings, he reel to reel yeah. tape. You know, he had some country and a, and a little bit of contemporary rock at the time. I remember he had a he had a Let It Be reel to reel tape. <laughs> but his younger siblings were much more into music. So I had an aunt that was sixteen and like sixty six, and um, she was like a screaming Beatles fan. My aunt and my grandma took a two-year-old Jeff McDonald to see the Beatles at Balboa Park in San Diego in 1965. Wow. Has that messed his hearing up ever since, (laughs) all the screaming? I mean, apparently it's one of his earliest memories. I mean, he was two, so it's hard to know how much of that's just from him imagining the story he had heard his whole life or how much of his actual memory. But yeah, he claims to remember that all the ruckus, all the commotion. And then, but then my aunt also says that Jeff fell asleep. So, you know, we don't know. But at any rate, so that's, you know, just to give a sense that, you know, it was deeply embedded in both of us at an early age. Then our youngest uncle, our uncle Shane, who was about nine years older than Jeff, like in 1972, when I'm five years old, because I'm born in 67, and Jeff was nine, maybe. Christmas of 72, I remember we were up at our grandparents' house, and Shane, who would have been 18 maybe then, and still living with our grandparents, he had an eight-track copy of Ziggy Stardust, of the Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust, and Jeff and I were like, what is this? And he was kind of iffy on it, and I guess, you know, reading Wikipedia now, that record would have come out that summer and this is Christmas. So maybe Shane had given it a shot, but he was, you know, eh, it's okay. He was more, Shane was more of like a cream kind of guy. He was into you know, Dylan and cream and he probably liked it, but I think that maybe the um, far outness of the image and everything wasn't necessarily his cup of tea. And, uh, but he said, you guys can borrow it if you want. So that was our introduction to Bowie. We took home that eight track of Ziggy Stardust on Christmas, 1972. And he, he never saw that again. He never he never got that eight track back. We wore that thing into the ground till, you know, I don't know if you remember if you ever had an eight track player, but you know, they had this whole thing where it was like the songs would be divided in between four different reels or something. And uh so sometimes a song would stop in the middle of it and then it would change tracks. It was a weird process, but also as the tape degenerated, it would start to play more than one song at a time. You could hear the songs bleeding into each other. (laughs) I'm sure we wore it into that place where it was playing half the album at once. Just two weeks later, you'd already worn it out. (laughs) Pretty much, pretty much. But, um, you know, so anyways, I just really took us down that path of um, glitter mania, which, and then also from from a UK perspective, it might be kind of hard to imagine, but like, that was mainstream music in the UK, I know. Like, I know that Starman was a hit. And he was on top of the pops in 1972. It wasn't mainstream music in America. It was cool music. Te- very sort of um, progressive teenagers and people in their young 20s, art students or whatever, maybe would go to a venue to see Bowie on the tours. But um, it wasn't... Uh, I think mainstream music, the more popular music in that time would have been, you know, I'm trying to think 72. I don't know because I was so young, but like people were still reeling from the Beatles or, you know, whatever. They're, you know, Sticky Fingers, the Rolling Stones would have been more of your mainstream music. And then this weird bisexual, sort of human, sort of man, sort of woman who knows what creature character. Um, yeah, he wasn't really like uh, none of my friends in, uh, in the first grade were um, bonding with me on this. <laughs> so, yeah. But anyways, that kind of started us down that path of uh, really investigating this music. And um, so those are some of my earliest memories, you know, and then, you know, we were just... Off and running. Yeah. I mean, also like around that same time, I remember I really wanted to impress my brother. So I think it was probably before I started school, but Jeff was already like into the second or third grade. And my mom took me to the record shop and said, pick out any two records. My guess is that I probably had like some kind of vaccination that morning. It had some shots and she was treating me for being a, you know, like a brave little guy. And so the two records I chose was, um, so this is probably 72. I chose the 1969 Stones live album, Get Your Yaya's Out. 
which I still love to this day. It's a classic. And then I also chose the Alice Cooper Group album Killer that has, you know, nice. Under My Wheels and Dead Babies. <laughs> and, you know, and it makes sense, a little five-year-old kid or four or five wanting that record with the boa constrictor on the cover. <laughs> was that on vinyl or was that still on 8-track? Those were vinyl purchases. And I remember because I... Killer, the original pressing of it came with like a, this amazing poster of Alice with a noose around his neck. <laughs> like, you know, it was had a really great packaging. Had you actually heard Alice Cooper by that point or was you just totally going off the imagery? I think that maybe the neighbor kids had the album before that had the hit song I'm 18 on it. So I think I was probably already aware of, because that actually was a hit record. That record somehow made its way into the mainstream in America. I mean, once again, for cool teenage kids, not five-year-olds, no. but I, you know, I lived on this big block and it was part of this like culture of five-year-olds might interact with 14-year-olds, you know, just a lot of all the kids are out on the street playing and exchanging, you know, just whatever things are excited about and i was always sort of allowed to hang out my brother and my brother was always really inclusive with me i guess that was also a unique experience of mine that not only was he inclusive he actively wanted me around he liked having his like little doppelganger hanging out <laughs> i love that yeah i was always included but then i still remember also another thing i remember was that he you know i was so wanted to impress him and he came home and i was like look what i got look what i got and uh He's like, oh, it's Al Skipper record. It's cool. And then he saw the Stones record. He's like, we already have a lot of these songs on other records. And he was upset, you know, because it was such a precious commodity, you know. Records were like $4. I don't know what that would have been in pounds in 1972, but, you know, it was hard to come by. And, um, and so, the, and the Stones, notoriously, they always repackage the same songs. Little did Jess know that these were the, you know, definitive live versions of these tracks, which were very unique. But I remember I was destroyed. It's like, oh, he didn't like my selection. I was so upset. I was so upset. Because yeah, I had been listening to the records, waiting for him to come home on our little shared record turntable. And uh, anyways, he, he eventually came around. And I think sometime around 2007, he officially apologized for criticizing me on that. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and wouldn't you hear a lot of new music played by Rodney Bingenheimer? Did he introduce you to a lot of bands on the radio? Well, that eventually happened. Yeah, so I'm sorry. I'm still lingering like in 1972. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I've actually been sort of writing some of this down. Yeah, because Jeff and I, we just had this really unique experience where, um, you know, we just love all the big arena rock bands and you know soon after um the bowie thing bowie kind of went soul and that confused us <laughs> because we were into loud crunchy guitars you know we loved mick ronson and when we heard the young american record young americans record all, ironically we were young americans we were like this isn't what we want <laughs> we were you know we were listening to black sabbath also you know so then kiss entered our world around the time that Bowie kind of left our world for a brief period Bowie left and uh, Kiss entered our world and then in January of 76 well Jeff got to go to a few rock concerts so okay so like the Wembley Arena of Los Angeles was the LA form okay 18,000 seat indoor arena where the LA Lakers basketball team played and it's also where the big circus came every year that was luckily only about three or four miles from our house and it's also where our parents went to go to see the Lakers play. So they sort of viewed it as like a safe venue, a, a reasonable place to drop their children off and let them go to concerts. And we, I mean, granted, we would beg them and beg them and please let us go. And so when Jeff was like 12, he got to go with the neighbor kids to go see Elton John in 1974. He saw Elton John and then he saw the last tour of Rod Stewart and the Faces. And then uh, he also saw, uh, he got to see uh, ZZ Top and Aerosmith open for ZZ Top on like, you know, they were on Toys in the Attic and uh, ZZ Top that had just released their Fundango Live album. So Jeff got to go to those three concerts and it drove me crazy because I, I mean, I, I was seven or something. <laughs> but I really wanted to go. So sometime at the end of 75, Kiss announced a concert. And at that point, we were crazy Kiss fanatics. We got the first Alive album and it blew our minds. It was everything we wanted. It was like all that glitter fantasy of Bowie, but then mixed with all that kind of Led Zeppelin loud guitar 
guitar and solos and all that crap and it was just a full package so they they announced this concert and i begged and i begged so my parents finally relented and they let me go with him it was february in 1976 we got to go to the i guess it would have been like the victory lap the second leg of the kiss alive tour the first kiss alive with like deuce and strutter and all that and you know i was talking to someone backstage and he told me a lot of you people like to drink vodka and orange juice <laughs> which I, which mind you come you know six months later he was still saying the exact same raps right. i remember you'd <laughs> memorize the actual kiss alive album and oh, i knew all of it i knew all of it so we got to the next year we got to see led zeppelin at the forum i saw them on the a presence tour which was the presence tour was actually last time they toured the u.s but before that enter the outdoor that sort of change they went through so it was still jimmy page and the dragon suit you know it was just like song remains the same you know except for they had a few new tunes. Um, but then we were exposed to the Ramones. And now I've been asking Jeff about all this because I'm like, how the hell did you get into this stuff? Because, you know, once again, this is not mainstream music. And Jeff was just a little kid. Like, I was a tiny <laughs> kid, but he was still just a little kid. And he didn't have an older brother. We had aunts and uncles that kind of, you know, started, you know, planted the seed, but they lived miles away. And we saw them a couple times a year. But Jeff was an avid reader of rock magazines, and he was reading Lester Bangs and people like that. Just all the little tiny columns as well, where somebody might just get a little mention. Exactly. Right. With people like Lenny Kay were sneaking in the New York Dolls, you know, under the radar. In fact, that's one of the records Jeff brought home in 1974. He brought home the second New York Dolls record, Too Much Too Soon, which is a weird-ass record. And we just ingested it right along. I remember Jeff also got the same year we got I mean, the first Kiss Alive album. He also bought the first Patti Smith record, which is like this weird, arty, you know, this poet from... <laughs> the Lower East Side or, you know, and um, singing, you know, going on these like stream of consciousness, you know, poetry rock jam. And we totally just took it in and we were into it. So there was this sort of this change. But I think the one band that really kind of took us from being a fan of arena rock and going to see bands in, at the form at this arena to going into the underbelly, the seedy underbelly of the Hollywood nightclub was the Runaways. The Runaways was the band that kind of bridged that gap for us. And that was because they put out their first album in 76 and they were in those magazines, Circus and Cream, but they were really rejected by the mainstream. It was like, I would have to equate it to like a lot of sexism. Like a lot of people still thought like, what, chicks can't play. And they thought it was the joke, like our friends, at least the same friends that would have the reaction about the Ramones and saying like, these dudes can't play. They thought it was somehow not on the same caliber of Black Sabbath and all that. So that's what kind of like tipped us off to this other kind of genre. And then sometime in 1977, Jeff heard about Rodney Bingenheimer's radio show on K-Rock. And this is after being exposed to the Runaways and the Ramones for a year and a half, maybe, and starting to learn about punk rock. You know, first you hear about new waves, this more palatable sort of uh, new music, and then a punk rock. You know, and we're hearing about what had happened in the UK with the Sex Pistols, but it wasn't the same kind of like mainstream. Yeah, it wasn't the press split. And then we heard about Rodney. And so Rodney Bing and I had a specialty show on Sunday nights on a local radio station, KROQ, which was still a small fledgling FM radio station. And, and, uh, and he had a two hour show, I think it was from eight to 10, and then soon eight to midnight. And he was playing punk rock music. And he was also playing music from the 60s. He had been a teenager in LA in the 60s and then hung out with all the cool scene makers like Sonny and Cher and the Birds and Arthur Lee and Love. And so he was kind of giving us a history lesson. Was you like glued around the radio? What, what's this he's playing? What's this? Oh, yeah. I mean, well, not only that, we had cassettes and we would, um, we would record his entire show. And then we would study it all week and listen to it. And so the main thing that he kind of did did for us was not only did he give us a sense of rock history and, and how what was going on in music in 1978, how it related to music from 1968 yeah. or 66 wow. or whatever. He was also teaching us about L.A. music in particular. I gotta say, cause this guy's just down the road from you. Yeah, he was in L.A. and he had been like um, a teenager. He had been in our shoes 20 years earlier. 
or 15 years earlier. So he was sort of turning us on to all this new music that we wouldn't have learned of anywhere else. And so we were learning about all the LA punk bands like the Weirdos and the Germs and the Bags and then some San Francisco bands. And there were these little, there were a few little indie labels. There was Danger House Records, which put out an amazing string of seven inches. And then there was a new fledgling company called Slash that had started a magazine. And then they had done a Germs single in the middle of 1978. So we were learning about all that. And then we kind of learned, wow, there's this whole other world that's near us. And the Whiskey A Go Go is this nightclub. Because on a clear day, and this is very smoggy, 1970s Los Angeles, before there were any kind of regulations on leaded fuel and brown sort of blanket over LA skies my whole childhood. But on a clear day, there was one like two story building in, at Jeff's school. Jeff and I were in different schools and at, like the science building. And on a clear day, you could see all the way to Hollywood. You could actually see the Hollywood sign 15 miles away north and uh, only on a clear day, <laughs> only, <laughs> only in certain winter conditions when the wind had blown the smog away. So it was something like the Emerald City, you know, in the, uh, in the far off distance. And uh, so then we just kind of, you know, refocused our torturing our parents. And instead of begging them to buy us concert tickets, like really expensive concert tickets, two or three times a year, we now had our sights aimed on going to a nightclub to see a punk rock band or the Runaways played the whiskey also. And these clubs were, there were a few in West Hollywood. There was the rock scene and the whiskey and they were all ages. And they would also do two shows a night. It was sort of this holdover from the 70s where a band like Led Zeppelin would come to L.A. for the first time and they would play a residency at the Whiskey and they would do two shows a night. So like in 1969, that's what they did. This is 1978 now. So it's past that era. But so a band like the Runaways might do maybe two nights and they would do two shows a night, regardless if they had sold out all the tickets or not. This is how they would do it. And um, so there was an early show and a late show. And it seemed reasonable to that maybe our parents would let us go to the 8 p.m. show. And they were just very sweet about it. I mean, they were confused by us. Like I said, my dad's a welder. He's, you know, he wasn't into this music. He's not a hippie. We didn't grow up on a commune. But they would drive us there and they'd find a parking lot next door and they'd sit in the car and wait for us. What was your first show at the Whiskey? It was at uh, the Avengers from San Francisco uh, and X, the LA band, supported them. And we had both of their singles on Danger House Records. So that was in July of 1978. And then um, later that year, we saw the Runaways. We had been fans of for a long time, but they played um, the Whiskey before they broke up in 78 as well so those were our first couple shows we got to go to and you know and then of course we the show would end and then we'd go outside to the car my parents said you're ready to go we're like no can we please stay for the second show can we stay for the like get the fuck in the car you're (laughs) so yeah that's what we were doing you know sometimes people are like how would you go in these shows your parents like are they not looking after you properly it's like no they actually were being very sweet although they might not have understood what we were into they thought well they're passionate about something they can see you going into the club they're waiting for you when you come out it's not like you just wander in the alleyways and all that kind of thing exactly and of course we had all sorts of intrepid about going because there was a lot of talk you know about punk rock about how it's dangerous and that the punk rockers would see you and they would know that you were actually a hippie and you know dressed as a punk rocker for a night they might hold you down and shave your head on the spot and so we were really worried about that <laughs> but we met all these people they were like into they thought it was so funny that you know i was 11 and jeff was 14 and they just thought it was so cute and most of these people at this stage in the la scene these are people that are kind of left over from the glitter scene or they were like you know art school students people in the early 20s and it wasn't really a teen thing it was more like um, just a weirdo thing <laughs> and they just like, oh it's a trip that's cool you guys came out that's cool and uh really nice to us and that right then that just set the fire on us we're like okay we've got to start a band we got to do this you know Joan Jett was in a band when she was 16 Jeff's like I'm 14 I can do it I can do it so we just started harassing our parents and begged them I got into I joined the school orchestra playing stand-up bass because you could rent the stand-up bass but there was or they'd lend it to you and there was always one kid in the school orchestra that actually had an electric bass and Jeff and I saw that and we're like get one of those things 
Stephen, you get one of those. I'll get one of the ones that have six strings on it. So you started playing more or less the same time. Yeah, totally. I, I, I actually had a bass before he had a guitar. For whatever reason, my wow. parents thought Jeff was too much of a rascal. They went and buy him an electric guitar. They did the whole thing like, get an acoustic guitar first and we'll see if it sticks, which is parents do that, but they don't realize... I mean, unless they're being really smart and they don't want, they're trying to steer their kid away from it. That's the easiest way to steer them away from it. Some nylon string classical guitar. Well, they sound like <laughs> shit. They won't stay in tune. And, they, and they're so hard to play, usually. So Jeff eventually had to get a job at like a fish and chip shop, and, which he did. And he had managed to scrape together enough money to buy a Stratocaster copy, Fender copy. But uh, yeah, so by the end of 1977, how did it go? Well, actually, I did the math on this. And I think it was actually Christmas of 77, I had a bass. And then by the middle of 78, he got himself an electric guitar. And then we went to that Germs and Adventures, I mean, Avengers and X show. And then we we're like, that's it. We have got to write our own songs. Jeff met a kid in class. Strangely enough, there was a kid in Photoshop that was also new about punk rock. And they were both developing pictures from punk rock shows, which I'll tell you was a real weird, like it was not a common thing. And um, Jeff had pictures of the Dickies and Greg Hudson had pictures of the Go-Go's or something. And uh, that must have blown his mind, though, to see that I, these are the people from the magazines I'm seeing. And you've you got photographs of them. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I mean, these well, from a, these small magazines that you had to go to Hollywood to get either there was only a few. There was a fanzine called Flipside that we l later learned about. And there was Slash Magazine. There was a magazine in San Francisco called No, or there was Search and Destroy. There were a few weird magazines. I guess there was Bomp, but these weren't carried in the local convenience store. The only records magazines that were carried in the local convenience store were Circus and Cream. And they did cover like the Ramones and Blondie. But we had like these L.A. bands that weren't covered in Nash any national magazine coverage, only in these weird local things that are now, you know, written about and talked about a lot. So Jeff found Greg Hudson, this other kid that was in his ninth grade Photoshop class, and he was older. He was maybe a senior. He had a car. That was a big deal. And he had a guitar. So Jeff invited Greg over to our house. Jeff says, I'm starting to band with my younger brother. Uh, we wrote some songs. And Greg's like, okay, I've got a guitar. And he came over to our house. We showed him some of our songs. And Greg got to the house and saw that Jeff's younger brother that he was starting a band with was 11 years old. <laughs> and he was a little freaked out. But we had songs. And uh, we were serious about it. We could play all the first few Ramones albums. And um, How was you learning all the bass lines to him? Just you know, playing along to the records. Yeah, just keeping up with Jeff. And we learned the Ramones and some of the runaway stuff. You know, a very remedial version of it. How good does it feel, though, when you start playing along to something? And that sounds just like what's on the record. It was amazing. Totally amazing. And, you know, when we watched, uh, there was um, one television show that was on Friday night called Don Kirshner's Rock Concert. And it was mostly like, you know, a lot of Doobie Brothers and stuff like that. But every once in a while, they had a few randos and cheap Trick was on it in 77, and so was the Ramones. And you could see Johnny Ramone making this bar chord on the guitar. And we're like, wait, what is that? And it's staying the same all the way up the neck. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and, you know, no minor chords. It's not complicated. This. Anyway, so there was little bits like that, little clues. We were getting little clues. And, you know, it was really remedial. I mean, you know, whatever. I remember seeing a Paul McCartney interview in the anthology series or whatever. Similar stories, you know, but those, but those guys were learning from like jazz records. <laughs> but him talking about him taking the bus across town because he knew someone knew how to play, you know, B7. And so he went and I'm like, oh, they learned the third chord, the, the B7, you know, and uh, it was foretold <laughs> that, uh, you know, some Johnny on, uh, you know, on the other side of town had the missing link, the Oracle. So it was like our version of that. That's basically, that's the whole like up until 1970. Eight. Then in 1979, in January of 79, Black Flag played their first show not far from us. And we found out about it probably from Rodney's show. And it was at a local Moose Lodge. Our parents were still driving us to places, but it was only like five miles away in Redondo Beach. We're like, we take us to this Moose Lodge, Redondo. 
They sat in the car, but we didn't, we went to go see the bands that Black Flag had got, the headliners. We went to see the Alley Cats and Rhino 39, who were both Danger House recording bands, who were also in Slash Magazine. And then there was this other weird, loud, noisy band opening called Black Flag. And that later turned out to be their first show. We met them soon after. At that point, we had already been rehearsing in our garage. We had cobbled together a set of songs including two covers, one which was Who Are the Mystery Girls by the New York Dolls. And we did this great sort of power pop punk version of I Want to Hold Your Hand, where we went through the progression once in Beatles speed, and then we went through the progression a second time in Ramon's speed. Oh, yeah, go something, did it, did it, I understand. And then we had our own tunes, like I Hate My School, Annette's Got the Hits about Annette Finicello. And we were called The Tourist at the time, not knowing that Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart already had a new wave band in the UK called that. But our reference to a tourist was, like I said earlier, um, like the scene at the beach where we spent a lot of summer days was uh, the surfers reign supreme, the teenage surfers, especially if they lived really close to the beach, like on the beach, then they owned the real estate on the waves because it was a very competitive scene who got to catch the waves. Mm -hmm. So there was a pecking order and sort of surf terminology. If you didn't live a stone's throw from the sand, then you were considered to be a tourist. You're someone who was not an insider. You're an outsider. So as we got into punk rock, it was before surf culture and beach culture and skate culture had embraced this weird new music. It, they were still all about Zeppelin and Ted Nugent and whatever and uh, Toto or something. <laughs> we embrace the fact that we're outsiders, you know, screw the surfers, even though we were like, wore nothing but surf, surfer clothes six months earlier and had feathered hair and looked like Matt Dillon in Over the Edge or whatever, like only six months earlier. But we were wanted to, uh, we wanted to be a part of this new movement. So that's where the name The Tourist came from. We were owning our outsider and that's how we didn't fit in with the popular crowd. So The Tourist went and we were very ambitious and we would call all, any band that we loved, we would find a way to get their phone number back then you could there was a phone book still or you would call the information operator 411 so we would call we would like try to call the singer of the dickies or the singer of the avengers we used to call x a lot i don't know how we got their numbers <laughs> and i mean and sometimes we get their parents you know and we got greg ginn from black flags number and we called him and we're like um, we have a band. Um, Jeff would always pimp me like some kind of Kim Fowley. He would say, um, I've got a band with my younger brother. He's 11. Can we open for you? And were they into that? Like, yeah, we got to see this. We got to see this. <laughs> well, great again, I think he laughed at it. He's like, oh, wow. You guys like punk rock? Wow. Okay. Well, we're going to jam tonight. You guys, if you guys want to come down and hang out, you can. So he invited us to come hang out at their rehearsal which turned out to be what is now infamously known as the church. It was just like, it wasn't fully abandoned, but it was a sort of repurposed church to this like salty beach town that's now like very gentrified. Hermosa Beach is very fancy real estate. But in the mid 70s, it was just a salty, funky little town. And there was a church there that was actually a bunch of hippies had the, um, the lease and they had repurposed it as some kind of like arts and crafts cultural center i think some hippies were making stained glass you know or they would like uh, pottery classes or something but most of the building was sort of in disrepair and black flag would rehearse in one of the rooms there they had like you know nailed ugly discarded shag carpet to the walls as like a budget soundproofing. How did it sound in there when they cranked all the amps? Or was it like, holy crap? <laughs> well, you know, okay, I mean, the sound is very dead, but their amps were like on 20. They played very aggressively and they have these, you know, big stacks and gigantic drums. And they were basically inventing Southern California, the first wave of what would be known as Southern California hardcore music, I guess. They were inventing that in these in these little carpeted rooms in this abandoned old church. And they invited us to come down and see them rehearse. And then when they were done rehearsing, they played their song. So they played like Nervous Breakdown, Fix Me, all those songs. And then when they were done with that, they said, hey, you guys have a band? Okay, here. And they handed us their guitars. And they essentially 
you know, had us audition to hang out with them. We auditioned to be their friends, essentially, or to be like their little pet mascots because they were twice our age, you know, essentially, and um, definitely twice my age. And we went through our little set and they sat there and they were charmed and thought it was funny. And you know, Raymond Pettibone, the famous artist who also designed the Black Flag logo, he would have been amongst the crew in that little padded room that day. And they thought it was funny and cute and they were totally charmed. And they're like, yeah, you guys can hang out. Cool. We're rehearsing tomorrow. Come back, you know. And then Greg had a car or a guitar player. So we finally gave our parents a break. And we were only going to Hermosa Beach, three, four miles down the road in the safe beach community. So come summertime of 1979, we're hanging out at the church every single day. And there's a little community of weirdos that have like coalesced around them. And a small little group of teenagers and a few other bands. The Descendants were just starting at that time. And so they were one of the bands. The Minutemen had been known as the Reactionaries, and they were going through a little bit of a change, but they would hang out. And then The Last, who were this classic power pop band. People don't know about The Last so much, but they were amazing. They put out a record on Bump Records, and um, Joe Nolte was this great songwriter, and he actually ended up producing our first recordings. But he was there, too. He lived there, too. And and I was just listening to some early last today, because someone was talking about 1979, and they were listening to these great records. And I said, well, have you heard this one? And I uh, there's a YouTube Someone's uploaded the the first last album, L.A. Explosion, and it's just a great record. And I really thought for a moment, wow, what an incredible sort of broad scope of sort of a lesson I was getting. I was being steeped in in underground music because on one side I had the last that were holding um, classic 60s uh, music in this high regard. And they're doing stuff that would have sat nicely on any Birds record or early Beatles record, too. And then Black Flag, who was inventing hardcore music in the other rehearsal room. These guys were all in their mid-20s and they were doing this for real and they were letting us hang out and they were being nice to us you just soaking it all in just learning all the time yeah yeah and then you know raymond pettibone um once again the artist was the sort of court artist <laughs> and he was a real weirdo you know he was sort of like um our bukowski in some ways because his text on all of his art his art was really very outlandish and really fucking smart and i didn't necessarily understand it then and now i love this stuff so, so he's the guy that did all the flyers or that first black flag single cover oh nice so the aesthetic he created the aesthetic for that world and um, and now he's someone that's you know shown in major museums all around the world he's the real hero of that story but uh at any rate so yeah so that's happening and that's and that's all through 79 1980 when did you realize you had to change the name so the tourist opened for black flag at a park in the redondo beach black flag um sent like a fake demo they i think they sent like fleetwood mac demos or something to the committee that was in charge of this like jazz music in the park series in a local park. <laughs> so there was a local park, Pollywog Park. And in the summer, they would have like light jazz music and families would go in this outdoor amphitheater and play volleyball and drink Chablis and have um, and be, you know, soothed by this light sort of music. And they gave them a demo tape that wasn't them. Gave this local, you know, Parks and Recreation Committee. They misrepresented themselves. <laughs> and they asked us to come and play at that show. And so that's when we were the tourists. That would have been um, June of 79. And we had just previously had them play our very first show, which was an eighth grade graduation party. So this time of year... 41 years ago, or yeah, 42 years ago now, 42 years ago, June in 1979, we played our very first show at an eighth grade graduation party. I was graduating sixth grade myself, and uh, but our drummer was graduating eighth grade. And some girl from his class said, I'm having a party after graduation. John, I know you have a band. Would your band like to play? And she probably thought that we were just like your standard cover band. So you would have been doing like Led Zeppelin covers around that time and maybe a Journey cover or something. I don't know. But um, anyway, so that was our first show was playing in a living room for eighth graders who were very confused <laughs> by us. And we asked, her name is Lisa Stengel. 
we asked Lisa, can we have our friends come and play too? And she said, sure. So Black Flag came and played that too. How nuts does that sound in retrospect? Yeah, a little bit Lisa single now. But um, so later that month, Black Flag had us play at Pollywog Park, which, you know, there were probably like 500 people, like families and this amphitheater. And during our show, people were polite and nice to the little kids. But by the time Black Flag played, they were throwing their watermelons at them. And it turned into, there was, there's now this infamous sort of riot. So those were the two tourist shows. And then we played parties at the church as well. But then um, sometime by the end of the summer, Black Flag invited us to actually play a nightclub with them. And they had just started gigging in Hollywood and in downtown, a few gigs. And um, they asked if we would like to come and join. But our drummer, unfortunately, was away for the summer. And we just were like, we've got to do this. So there was a kid that lived at the church, just sort of like a little bit of like a runaway kid. He was our age, but he was he had a different kind of, he had been handed, a, a dealt a different hand of cards. As it was a bit rougher than us. And uh, anyways, he's like, I can try to play. His name was Ron Reyes. He's like, I will try to play. So he just learned our set and he just kind of had the right spirit. He was punk and he was very punk. He lived at the church and, uh, then around that time we learned about Annie Lennox's band and we're like, oh, well, okay. this new wave band from the UK has the same name. And we were pissed, but we're like, I, you know, they already had a record out. So we were just probably trying to figure out, well, what name would sound good with Black Flag? And I don't know who came up with it. I mean, for all I know, Raymond Pettibone named us. I have no idea. At some point, someone said, Red Cross, how about Red Cross? And we're like, sounds right. So that's how that happened. And so it was like August of 79 till December of 79. We gigged all the time. I started seventh grade in September of 79, which was junior high school, middle school. Was it messing your education up at all? Was you like off asleep during all the lessons? Well, I've been trying to remember those times because I've been finding flyers. I see flyers online. So the first thing I do is I go like, okay, so like whatever it was, like, you know, October 23rd, 1979, what day of the week was that? A Wednesday. Holy shit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like, you know, there's one flyer that had like four shows that we did in October of 79. And like two of the shows were on weekdays, but they were like with bands that I worship, like the bags. And so um, I was like, I'm sure we played this show and I'm sure we pushed the luck and we stayed the whole night. We didn't like pack up and bail right afterwards because it was still such a thrill to go to a show. Because you've got a you've got a son now who's like, what is he, 11 or 12 years old himself? He just turned 12. Have you gone through that deep, like, holy shit moment thinking what I was doing at that age? And could you imagine letting him loose? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't really know. And, he, like, and the thing is, he's like, because uh, our kind of thing with him was always like, we're in no rush, you know, like, we still, we baby him and we don't care, spoiled, whatever, stay as young as you want, as long as you want. Yeah. The world is going to, it's going to, you know, it's going to invade your world eventually. How did you find being in the studio for the first time doing your EP? Was that intimidating for you? Or? Yeah, it was a thrill and it was scary at the same time, you know? I love it though. Most of those songs start with like a kick-ass bass intro. It's like, I'm taking this song. Uh, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> Another thing my brother was always really encouraging to me, you know, yeah, there's one song called, uh, well, yeah, there was, yeah, a lot of them, they all kind of do. For some reason, they're probably pushing me out front on purpose, like, some the gimmicks, some the novelty out the front of the stage. Da, 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 da. But a lot of those riffs I wrote too, you know. At any rate, um, I wrote that riff. I wrote the riff to Nesca Pesos. The original sound had like this great garage rock punk feel, but over time you developed into showcasing like really cool pop melodies and hooks. Was that a conscious shift or was you just you guys just growing and gelling as a band? I think most of the stuff, the music was very just organic. I think there's probably a little bit of conscious, you know, sculpting of like uh, aesthetic, like uh, like how we wanted to dress or how we wanted to sort of identify ourselves from everybody else. Much of that would be through fashion and are also wearing our influences on our sleeve. You know, what, what kinds of influences were we um, flying the flag of? Some of those things were consciously thought of probably by Jeff. But for the most part, yeah, just the process of practicing and trying to take it more seriously. And, you know, you inevitably, you just kind of develop. Yeah. I don't know if you mind sharing it, but I had a really cool story. Was you invited to open a Bangles show one time, then asked not to play? Oh, yeah. yeah. It turned into a whole thing with your Thunderbird yeah. bass. <laughs> so in 1980, I think it was 83, maybe. 
early 83 or late 82. Once again, my parents were very supportive. And I had the second base I ever owned was a friggin' Gibson Thunderbird that I bought secondhand. So, but it was, you know, $400 in 1982. That's, that's a nice chunk of change. Yeah. And it was a much nicer instrument that I probably deserved to have when I was 14 years old. But all the same, they, they were encouraging to me. And um, I owned this Gibson Thunderbird that I worshipped. I knew I was very familiar with every sort of every grain of that instrument. Not that I could play it very well, but I just I worshipped it. You know, I was I probably slept with the bass. So at early 83, I guess it was, we were going to play a show, a rare out-of-town gig in Tucson, Arizona with my brother's girlfriend's band. And at the time he was dating Vicky Peterson of the Bengals. And we, we, Jeff and I were always been groupies. You know, he always liked, uh, you know, other artists. He eventually married a go-go and I married uh, Anna from that dog. But uh, but so Jeff had a very serious relationship with Vicky Peterson for several years. But in that first bit, they invited um, us to come out and play a date on their first tour. And they were going to go around the whole country, but we just went on the first date, Tucson, Arizona. They had a real booking agent. So we went into this like fancy new club and they actually got Vicky's boyfriend's band a real guarantee. The agent got us a $400 guarantee. And we were like, whoa, $400, unbelievable. And so we did sound check. And after sound check, the owners of the club, who were like these kind of seedy kind of like, love you, babe, industry, almost kind of maybe like Tony Soprano, shady people. They wanted to see us back in, you know, in the office. And uh, the guy sat down with me and the Bengals road manager, <laughs> maybe 15. Sat down with me and Chris Lampson, the road manager of the Bengals, and the guy says, the guy's explaining to me, he's like, see, we're a new club here in Tucson, and uh, we're in the business, uh, we'd like to be in the business of entertaining the people of Tucson. And with that in mind, we would like to, uh, after seeing your performance, we're just not convinced that what your sound is exactly what we feel is a, a, good, a right fit with what we're trying to do here at our venue. So we're going to pay you. It's all good. You get your guarantee. But we're going to ask if you'd be okay not performing tonight. <laughs> like, what? Wow, no one's ever paid me not to play. I've never ever paid me this much anyway, as much less than not to play. So I was like, okay, great. Fine. Yeah, we're good. All good. And then liquor laws are a little looser outside of California. And I think it's like 19 is the age limit. And I was a tall 15-year-old that's six foot already and Susanna Hoffs just thought it was funny I don't know and she was buying me drinks all night just keeps getting better yeah and I had a big crush on Debbie Peterson on Vicky's younger sister so I was flirting with Debbie I thought she was probably just humoring me and Susanna was buying me Long Island iced teas all night which are like you know rum and whiskey <laughs> anyways I was like off my tits. And in fact, there's even photos of that show of Jeff and I on stage go-go dancing for the Bengals. We did like uh, Pushing Too Hard by the Seeds with them. And I was just like going crazy, just dancing. Jeff at least had a tambourine. And Des Kadena was in the band at the time. Des, who later sang for Black Flag. <laughs> but Des was on there playing Vicky Strat. And uh, I'm just dancing. <laughs> I was off my tits. Anyway, so at the end of the night, we pack up our stuff. What a great night. So much fun. And I sober up. And I was going to drive drive to the hotel and go home. And say, oh, wait, with my base. I got to get my base. So I go back up the ramp and I'm about to walk back into the venue. And these like big thugs like stop me at the door. What are you doing? Oh, I got to get my guitar. There's nothing in here. What? Everything's gone. I don't think so. I got to get my base. Nothing's here. And then it's like, they just like, you know, basically like strong arm me and push me out of the way. <laughs> So basically what becomes very clear is that these people are confiscating my instrument for having paid us, ironically, the exact same number we had spent on the guitar the year earlier, $400. And I always felt horrible. I didn't know what to do, you know? And uh, and my parents, I couldn't tell my parents. I thought because... Because every time we'd leave town, I was always afraid, like, because they were being so cool and liberal with us, we didn't want to mess up. Like, oh, I got, I got my bass stolen, you know? Uh, what do I do? And so I didn't, I didn't file a police report or anything. And uh, we just kind of went home with our tail between our legs. And we cashed the check, though, luckily. <laughs> yeah, and it was good. So whatever. But uh, 
Yeah, so flash forward 15 years later, that instrument, that very instrument, like I said, I knew every grain, every every curve of the instrument shows up at a secondhand shop. Because hadn't you broke the jack socket? Exactly, yeah. So yeah, because I had broken the jack. I pulled the jack out and, they, and, and a luthier in Los Angeles uh, had done a, a great job of fixing the jack and, and actually repositioning it, putting it in a different place on the instrument. He put it on the side of the instrument instead of on the face. Um, and it made it unique. But also, even aside from that, I knew every nick. So I see this natural finished 1976 T-Bird at a secondhand shop on Sunset. Did you actually find it or did someone alert you to it? Oh, yeah, because I always like looking at secondhand guitar. I'm, I'm a guitar nerd. I bet your stomach dropped, didn't it? He was like, holy shit, can't believe what I'm seeing. Well, at first, like... Holy shit, that's fine. But it's like, um, can I see that instrument? I want to try because it, it was way up, like up on the top of the wall. You had to ask them to like let you try it, whatever, and they'd let it bring it down. I'm holding that, going like, oh shit, this is my bass. What do I do? In 1994 or something, they wanted like $2,500 for it. It was overpriced, but it was it was kind of a Japanese collector's price, but actually fetchable at the time and um but i didn't have that and i already didn't want to you know <laughs> at any rate eventually i i confronted the man about it but i went back with reinforcements and i had my friend dave had a video camera and thirst more for whatever reason sonic youth was with us that day <laughs> And then in a very my nasally voice, I confront the guy, and I'm like, I'm like that's my base, and uh, I can't even watch it. I'm so embarrassed. At any rate, it's it's viewable on YouTube. You can watch me confront the gentleman. And the other thing, you know, for any shop employees that decide to watch this or whatever, any guitar players. I mean, in my defense, I will say that one of the reasons why I was so aggressive with him, this guy was a notorious asshole. <laughs> Aside from this whole experience, everybody knew this guy was like really cranky and really um, treated musicians with like the utter lack of respect. He was really rude. He was like that really patronizing guy. Like if a girl had gone in to check a guitar out, he would have been like, is this for your boyfriend? Things like that. Just a real prick. Because even just asking to try a guitar on the wall with that guy, he was going to treat you like, get out of here, kid, you're bothering me. You're going to get that kind of attitude from him. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so shrill and confrontational about the whole thing. I ended up taking him to small claims court. I couldn't really like prove without a shadow, beyond a shadow of a doubt or however they do it there. But the judge knew I wasn't full of shit. So he's like, you got to you gotta come back with more evidence. Like, you need a police report, which I didn't have. But it was clear I was going to keep taking him back. And I finally said, well, why don't you pay for it? Just sell it to me for that. And he eventually sold it to me for what he paid for it, which was 600 bucks. So whatever. I've got my 76 T-Bird yeah. for a collective 1000 bucks. It took a crazy, a long trip around uh, the Southland. It's a great story, man. It's a great story. Yeah, these things happen, I guess. But there's a if there is any kind of um, you know lesson to be learned, always who cares if your parents seem to get mad at you? Get a police report. Go down there and uh, walk through your anxiety and um, follow whatever the procedure is. Something which went under my radar during the early two thousands, you recorded bass lines for the White Stripes album and put them online. Yeah. I never knew that. I did that. That's great. And it all went nuts, right? Yeah. People loved it. Well, I kind of, yeah, I guess the server, cra crashed the server. But um, yeah, so you might not have known of it because like at the time, Red Cross has kind of gone um, on hiatus. So from like 97, 98 to around mid 2000s, we weren't, Jeff and I had put it on the back burner and uh, I was doing other things and trying other avenues into music, like producing and things like that. And, but uh, but yeah, when the, this band, the White Stripes, started taking over the airwaves and uh, this new breed of kids that thought they were better with one instrument shy. I mean, if, you know, they had lightened their load by um, basically trying to make my instrument extinct is how I felt. <laughs> uh, so like, oh yeah, you guys think you're better without a bass? Okay. Maybe with most bass players, but you're not better without my bass. <laughs> that, was, <laughs> that was my egotistical point of view, I think. <laughs> Also, I think I also just kind of missed not being in a band. And I had just gotten, uh, I had just gotten sort of handy with home recording. I, I got a, a version of Pro Tools a couple of years earlier. So yeah, I, what I did was I in, imported the first two songs on the third White Stripes album, which was their sort of breakthrough album, their album White Blood Cells. I imported it into my Pro Tools and I just got out my bass 
and I laid down a bass track. And then what I did was I then took that, mixed that together into another, you know, two channels, like a regular recording, and I uploaded it onto redcross.com. This is sort of before MySpace and Facebook and all that. Even though Red Cross was not active, a fan, a fan and friend had created a web space for us. So we had a little bit of a web presence. My brother was doing like weird web art and stuff. And so I did that. And I put two songs of the White Stripes with me on bass up on the web. And then I called the only phone number on their website, which turned out to be their booking agent. They were going to be in town doing three nights at a theater in town. And I said, you know, I don't know if you know anything about my band. I'm in a band called Red Cross, but I just put bass on your band's song and I put it up on our website. Maybe they'd like to have a word with me tonight. I don't know. It was only kind of like a cheap shot to get free tickets. Like little did I know that, you know, I mean, Jack White's a really sweet guy, but he's also known for being like pretty old fashioned. He's he's known to settle more than one dispute the old fashioned way. Right. <laughs> and I'm not that guy. I don't know what I was doing, but I mean, because he could have taken real offense to it and um, he could have laid me out probably. But um, at any rate, the agent turned out to be someone that had booked Red. I guess I forget that people knew who we were and stuff. (laughs) (laughs) And their agent had actually, one of the first shows he had ever put together was a Red Cross show in San Francisco in like 1981. So he was like, I know who you are. And okay, yeah, come to the come to the show. And then so I went to see the White Stripes at the El Rey Theater in LA and Jack had me backstage and Jack was just like, so you put music on the computer? And we, he's like, so people can get it on the computer? And he's like, you know, pretending to like play with the computer keys. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, is that okay? He's like, sure. And I was like, well, I was thinking about doing the rest of the record and putting it up. I mean, what do you, is that okay? And he was cool with it, you know? And um, so then I just kind of turned it into like a proto blog where I tried to be respectful and I would put a song up each week and take the other one down. I had this whole artistic thing where I was talking. I pretended like I was in the White Stripes. A friend had like photoshopped me into one of their pictures. I wore like a red shirt and white pants and it looked like I was in the band. And uh, and I would talk about what it was like to jam with my brother and sister. No way. Jack and Maggie each week. And, you know, which was quite a feat to jam with them because they had their own sort of rhythm, you know, like uh, they had, you know, because the, the way they would actually play in real life, they're playing in person and um and they're watching each other. They're watching each other. So their tempos are kind of all over the place and they're hitting stabs that are really surprising. So it, it, it was a little bit challenging. But uh, anyways, I tried to be artistic about it and I wrote about it the best I could at the time. And so it was a series that went on for a couple months or something. And so for the, at the very end, I was like, I'm going to put everything up just for like one weekend. So you, you can hear or you can download the whole thing for one weekend. And then I, that'd be the end of it. That was the grand finale. And then much to my surprise, the New York Times reviewed it. <laughs> They reviewed it and put the web page up, and they gave it like a better review than they ever gave Red Cross. This is the music industry. You never know. And they gave it this rave review, and they thought it was like really forward thinking. And, and so, yeah, anyways, they, they got so much traffic that the server crashed. And then Jack White later like gave a um, you know a public statement about it in a in a cool magazine called um, fuck what's the magazine called? Was Bob Bird of Sonic Youth? wife who's now since deceased had this great cool like magazine in the early 2000s called um i'm drawing a blank but someone got to look it up but uh jack white did a great he spoke about it he sort of saw the whole project as like understanding the spirits of the white stripes and he thought it was that everybody's a member of the white stripes and that everybody should feel included and that um and that's exactly what his idea was and then he also went on some tirade about blues music and how he could hear he could hear my pain in my tracks, which I thought, you know, uh, you kind of called me out on that. It's probably true. (laughs) Stupid bass guitar. Yeah, I was probably in a little bit of pain because I missed being in a band. Wow, man. I love that, though. It's amazing. A great story. That was cool. Yeah. And and so flash forward to 2020 and Jack White's label reissued um, to... Red Cross albums, Show World and Face Shifter. And we've had, we've done singles and stuff, different little things for Third Man as well. And But they still haven't released a vinyl version of what I call Red Blood Cells. Yes. Uh, with two Ds, like Red Cross. They still haven't released it. And 
And although there's a, there, one of my friends, Dave Buick, always talks about wanting to do it. I don't know if Jack, it's a little complicated for Jack. I don't know. Maybe he'll do it someday. Who knows? Stephen, I've took up way too much of your time, but I've I've loved hearing your stories, man. It, it's been awesome. Um, you're back in the UK next year, fingers crossed, right? We are, yeah. I mean, as, as long as uh, everyone, you know, get your vaccinations and uh, stay safe, and uh, hopefully everything will be cruising along by then. So we're looking forward to it. I hope to see everybody. All right, man. You take care. Appreciate it. Thanks a lot, man. I love that. I really did. Thank you so much to Stephen McDonald of Red Cross for such an amazing insight into his band's history with such great, unique stories. Hope you enjoyed it too and maybe check out more about the band over at redcross.com. Their latest album, Beyond the Door, is out now and they'll be on tour in Europe and the UK early next year. So next time we speak, it will be episode 100 of the Straight to Video podcast. Now, I didn't even think the show would make it this far, but it's down to your great enthusiasm for these chats and your wonderful feedback that has given me the confidence to keep putting these together. And it's been more rewarding than I could ever have imagined. So thank you so much. Please, if you can, check out any earlier episodes you may have missed over at stvpod.com. And if you have a few seconds, please give the show a like or share to anyone that might like to join us along the way. With the launch of episode 100, I'll be sharing plans on how I plan to make the show bigger and better with your help and input. So if you're excited to be part of that, get ready to hold on tight as we take things to the next level. Love you all and thank you for being so supportive and can't wait to speak to you all again soon. Mm -hmm.